Going live. All right. Hello, everybody. Dr. Alex Earl here at Pure Plastic Surgery with Dr. Vidal. Hey and it's pump day. Hello. All right. Uh, so we got a very special guest here, Dr. Vidal. As you all know, she's been with us for over a year now. A year uh, and two, three months already. A year and three months and one yeah. baby later. Yes. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So we're excited to do the, uh, the, the dual live here today. Uh, we are on YouTube. We are on Instagram and we are on TikTok. All right. And so today we thought it'd be a great subject to talk about a lot of the safety measures that we uh, have here at Pure because you hear us, uh, both of us, you know, talk a lot about safety, which is, of course is our number one priority or number one concern. So a lot of these lives, Dr. Riddell's lives, she does on Tuesdays, Tuesdays tips, you guys should definitely check that out. And of course the hump day lives here on Wednesday. Um, of course, we, we talk about all sorts of plastic surgery topics, but a lot of it revolves around safety, okay? But we don't just talk the talk, right? It's not enough to just talk the talk. We see that a lot. We know, you know, people just say, oh, we're, we're super safe. Well, you know, what are you doing? What, what makes you super safe, right? So it's not enough to just talk to talk, you got to walk the walk um, and you got to make sure that you are implementing things that are going to try to have the safest outcome for your patients. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take it away. We've got a few of them up here. There's probably a few more, but these are the ones that kind of came to the top of our heads here. Um, and so we're going to start with BMI. The BMI. Yes. BMI limit. So BMI stands for body mass index is basically a calculation using your weight and your height. Uh, to determine a number. And that number, what it means is basically a risk stratification for different things in medicine. Uh, and one of those is for surgical risks. And that's why we use it uh, to stratify our patients and to put a limit because if it go too high, then your risks of surgery are too high and then risks outweigh the benefits. So what is that limit? So basically, um, it depends on the surgeon and I'll explain a little bit why we have different uh, indications or, li or different limits on the BMI. Uh, but basically, for me, it's uh, less than 33.5 and for Dr. Earl, it's less than 30. So more than 30, you are overweight. You're sorry, you're obese class one. Yes. So normal BMI is between 18 to 24. That's the normal BMI. If you go above 24, 25 to 30, that's overweight. When you go above 30, 30 to 35, that's obesity class one. Um, so when you are above 30, your risks for surgery are a little bit higher than for the rest of the population. And that is why Dr. Earl limits it to less than 30. But there are some studies that have been shown that less, the lower obesity class, so BMIs that are in the low 30 range and you have no medical conditions and the patients understand those increase in risk, it is still safe to do surgery on those patients. But you have to understand that your risk for blood clots and wound healing complications is a little bit higher than if your BMI was less than 30. So ideally, everyone should be in a BMI less than 30, but if you do have a BMI in between 30 to 33.5, then we might need to do some things to decrease your risks. What are those things? Be more aggressive or more proactive with the walking, with um, hydration, to try to prevent the blood clots sometimes, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we, I, I, I add um, blood thinners to some of my patients if that's the case. Uh, but that's the reasoning why the BMI is so important. It's associated with risks post-op. Yeah, so that's exactly right. So a lot of studies actually have demonstrated this. So as the BMI goes up, complications go up. Uh, and the ones that we, we kind of are really scared about are those blood clots. So, uh, so yeah, if you start to, you know, certainly anything above, for sure, I've never in my career have ever done anyone above 35. Actually, I don't think it's safe for a completely elective surgery yeah. to do above 35. Uh, and then when, if you're in that 30, between 30 and 33.5, then we gotta look at you a little bit closer, make sure no other comorbidities, and make sure that you really understand exactly what you gotta do post-op to minimize those risks, all right? Well, that takes us a little bit to the, the next uh, measure that we have here, which is what we call the ASA classification. That's actually an anesthesia classification um, that are used to stratify patients as well. Um, and here at Pure Plastic Surgery, we only do ASA class one or class two patients. So what does that mean? So an ASA uh, category one or class one, that's a patient that has 
no medical comorbidities. That means completely healthy uh, and has basically no past medical history whatsoever. Completely clean slate, okay? Uh, and, and then the other category that we, that we do is category or class two. Um, and that's someone that has, has you know, a medical condition but it is very well controlled, okay? So what are examples of those? So examples of those are diabetes, uh, high blood pressure, uh, hyperthyroid. You know, these are the types of things that, it, yeah, it is okay to have surgery, but we gotta make sure that they are controlled. So you, yes, you have high blood pressure, but you're on medication and that stabilizes your blood pressure. Or yes, you have diabetes, but you have it well controlled and your hemoglobin A1C, which we will check, is 6.5 or less, okay? Thyroid, your thyroid levels have to be within limits, okay? So those are the two, so either no medical uh, conditions whatsoever or a controlled medical condition. Um, now, if you go into a class three, that's when you have medical conditions that are not controlled. And, th and then we won't, we won't do those cases here at Pure, right? We'll cancel those cases. So that's why we check those things. So for example, you're diabetic, you wanna have a BBL. Uh, but we checked your hemoglobin A1C and it's like 8.5. Well, that means unfortunately your diabetes is not controlled. We can't do surgery. You got to go back to your primary care doctor. They got to, you know, regulate all your, whatever it is, your oral medications, your insulin levels to get you down to that uh, hemoglobin A1C before we proceed with surgery. All right. And that goes hand to hand with the next topic with age restrictions. Okay. With more age comes the risk of having more comorbidities. Uh, and even though you're completely healthy, if you are in the older range, uh, the risk of having complications from anesthesia increase. So your lung and, and heart, um, they age with you and they react differently to anesthesia. And also, especially when we're doing liposuction or BBL procedures, when we remove large amount of fat from your body, it takes a toll in your system, in your cardiovascular system, your, your heart rate, your blood pressure, all of it responds and has to adjust to all those fluid requirements and all the fat that has been removed. And with aging, all those changes, it's not the same running two miles when you're 20 or running two miles when you're 60. Your body doesn't respond the same way. So that is one of the main reasons we have age restrictions to keep you not only healthy, but that your, cardio, your baseline cardiovascular system is adequate to respond to general anesthesia and to fluid changes, such as in the liposuction and BBL cases. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and you know, and I've seen, you know, it, it's, Probably the, one of the biggest issues is with the large liposuction, lipo 360 in the BBLs, yeah. uh, because there's a lot of what we call fluid shifts, okay? And older patients don't tolerate fluid shifts as well. So um, in my experience, you know, I used to have a little bit higher age range, and then those were the patients that were having to need a little extra help with that more IV fluids and their hydration because they couldn't tolerate it. And then sometimes they would go to the hospital for IV fluids and things like that. So we want to limit that. Again, we want to limit complications. We want to get that as low as possible. Remember though, it's never going to be zero, right? It's impossible to have zero complications rates. Uh, but we want to try to limit that as much as possible. Okay, and that's why um, along with, you know, how do we determine what ASA category you're at? Well, we got to do a lot of things before surgery to make sure that you are qualified to have surgery. So that's where the pre-op comes in, right? It's super important. You're gonna get a call from a pre-op department approximately 45 days before surgery, and they're gonna explain all the things that you need to do in order to prepare. But importantly, we gotta do quite a few things. We gotta get your labs, right? We're gonna check your blood levels. We're gonna check your, what we call the, the your metabolic profile, which is all your electrolytes, um, including your kidneys, how the kidneys are working. Uh, we're gonna check your coagulation parameters, make sure your blood is not too thin. Uh, and, and you're not going to kind of have any bleeding issues with surgery. Um, and then, uh, you know, we check quite a few other labs as well, depending on any specifics. For example, if you have thyroid issues, we're going to do a thyroid panel. Okay. Um, we check the EKG. We do that for all patients. I know some, some, even some primary care docs will tell us, well, like, like, she's 25. She's perfectly healthy. Why are you getting an EKG? Well, this is a completely elective surgery, right? So my, my question back to them is like, why not get an EKG? It's completely non-invasive, right? It doesn't hurt the patient at all. And what if we find something that she didn't even know about, some sort of arrhythmia or something like that? Well, we don't want that to pop up when we're doing surgery. We wanna know about that beforehand, okay? So everyone gets an EKG and everyone gets a clearance from their primary care doctor, which is very, very important because 
theoretically, this is the doctor that knows you the most, right? This is someone you've been to a few times before, so they know all about your medical history, your past surgical history. They know whether you know your social history as well, which is important, whether any past you know smoking or drugs or alcohol or things like that. So we have to be aware of all that. Plus, they always also provide us with a little window into your BMI. So that's part of the physical exam there. So they're going to show us your height and your weight. Um, and if it's going to be way too high, then we're going to have to potentially postpone that surgery until you can lose weight and get within our BMI limit. So that's very, very important. And then for women over 40, uh, we're going to be doing the mammograms as well. But this is super important. This is what basically determines whether you are going to be cleared for surgery or not. And this gets seen by multiple, multiple people. It gets seen by Dr. You know, for her, Dr. Rudell's patients, she's going to take a look at this and her, and her, her CRNA is going to take a look at this. Our pre-op department is going to take a look at this. So we're going to have multiple eyes on this because the more eyes that you have on this, the better so that you try not to miss anything. So by the time the patient comes here to peer, they're, you know, good to go. So all these things are before you come in, right? All, all, all the safety measures that we've talked about so far are things that we do before you come in, making sure you're your optimal shape and you are ready for surgery but what safety things we do once you're here for the surgery um, are this this one is the ultrasound guided uh, fat tra gluteal fat transfer so we both use the ultrasound to guide our fat injection when we're doing a bbl or fat transfer procedure to the buttock and hips the reason for that is to make sure that our cannula we're injecting the fat is not in the muscle we, some of you guys have heard and we've talked, Dr. Earl and I have talked in different uh, videos about this, but one of the complications that can happen when we're doing this type of procedure is a fat embolism, which is a piece of fat, one globule of fat getting into the vein system and going to your lungs. Uh, and that can be very critical and even fatal. So the studies have shown that how does this happen is when you're injecting the fat in the muscle that's when that the fat has access to the venous system and can get to your lungs. If you're injecting fat above the muscle in the subcutaneous space, then that's what we call the safe space. It's not connected to the muscle, not connected to that venous system, so there's no risk of fat embolism. And how do we know we are injecting the fat in the space that we need to? Well, we use the ultrasound. An ultrasound is a portable machine that we both use in the operating room um, under sterile conditions. We put it and we're visualizing and making sure that the fat is getting what we need to. That's exactly right. And we, well, uh, I've been doing it since 2019 and Dr. Dow has been doing it since she started here pretty much from day one. Uh, and it's super, super important um, so, you know, that really, really helps, you know, decrease any potential morbidity or mortality from a fat embolism, uh, the use of the ultrasound there. Uh, the next thing that, that we, that we do that also kind of around surgery time, um, is we want to try to m minimize the risk of blood clots. All right. When we talk about blood clots, we, we talk about your DVTs, which stands for deep vein thrombosis. And these typically start in the back of the leg and the calf area. Uh, or your PEs, which is a pulmonary embolus, okay? And this can happen uh, after pretty much any surgery under general anesthesia. Uh, and so we want to minimize that risk. And so for most, most of our patients, which, uh, which do fall between kind of BMI 30 or, or below, uh, what we provide for our patients are what's called an SCD, a sequential compression device, okay? And this is gonna be for anyone that's having uh, a tummy tuck. So whether tummy tuck on its own, or a mommy makeover, okay? Why that? Because tummy tucks have the highest risk of blood clots, of any aesthetic kind of elective procedure that we do, all right? So if you're gonna, have, if you're gonna get a tummy tuck, whether it's combined with anything else or, or on its own, we are going to provide this device for you, which is really, really cool because it's portable, you can take it with you, and you are gonna take it home because you're gonna be using that for two weeks, two week minimum, okay? Um, and this is you know, where, where the patient's compliance is extremely important. You have to use this device for two weeks, pretty much most of the time, whenever you're sleeping, whenever you're traveling, especially on the airplane or the car, if it's a long trip. Uh, and whenever it's just not being very active, for example, if you're watching a movie or something like that, okay? So pretty much all the time. The other thing the patient has to do and be extremely compliant with is walking. So you gotta walk at least 10 minutes every hour while awake, okay? 
Um, and so while we provide this, it is up to the patient to make sure that they're following these, uh, you know, these guidelines so that they don't get a blood clot, okay? They really, it's super, super important. And what happens if you get, start getting to the higher BMI range? So, you know, to that between 30, 33.5, uh well then yeah. yeah we're gonna so then yeah. if you are in that bmi range we are in obesity classification so i use another classification called the caprini score the caprini score is a risk stratification for patients to determine your risk of having blood clots after the surgery it takes into consideration the bmi but it takes into consideration other things as well the length of the surgery your past medical history uh prior history of blood clots and other stuff so depending on that score, then I might send some of my patients in blood thinners. Uh, Lovenox, it's an injectable uh, that you put in the thigh, usually is the most um, comfortable area to be put it. Once a day, 40 milligrams, and we started the day after surgery and we, and we continue for two weeks. Why two weeks? It's because that's when the risk is still high for blood clots. It's not only the day or the day after surgery, the risk is still there until two weeks after surgery. It's higher than the normal population. So that's why the SCDs or the blood thinners for at least two week length. Right, and another thing related to blood clots is how quickly you can get on the plane to go home. So this is, this is a very strict rule here. So you have to be here at least five days post-op. That's the bare, you know, bare minimum if you've had surgery under general anesthesia. Why is that? Because the studies have shown, once again, that the risk for blood clot on a flight is much, much higher if you go in, you know, within those five days. So there's actually a white paper put out by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons um, that uh, basically has stratified this. And so they've determined that it's safe, you know, safe enough, if you put it that way, as long as you're following all the rules, uh, to go back and fly back home uh, after post update number five, okay? And that's where this comes in. So that's why we do all these videos. That's why we have uh, the lives, okay? Because a lot of safety has to do with what the patient knows what to do, right? It's a lot about communication, a lot about education. So for example, the patient had no idea how to use these SCDs or how long they had to use it, then the fact that we just give you this box is gonna do nothing for you, right? So education is extremely important. Uh, knowing why we go through all these things is also, you know, extremely important because people may get upset because of their, you know, their BMI is high or their age and whatnot. But you got to really do all this, put everything together to try to minimize those risks as much as we can. All right. Yeah. Um, Reach yeah. a thousand likes. Yeah. Oh, all right, all right, all right. That's the one. All right, and so lastly, because we do want to get to some questions for sure. Yeah. Um, what What is kind of if you want to call it the proof that we're you know doing all these things what's the the walking the walk and not just talking the talk well we are actually we are certified by the joint commission we have that certification which is the highest level of certification that you can get um in an elective you know office space you know or operative setting that we have here okay you cannot get higher than that okay and that's because we've gone the extra steps okay to try to, to increase the safety as much as we can and that has been recognized and we get surveyed by them every so often actually we're having one coming up soon um and they and, you know they check everything and because of that we're able to get that certification so that's what we have here up here all right but enough of this let's get to some questions let's do it i have a lot <laughs> <laughs> oh. let's do it okay this well, what do i need for a bbl what do I need? You need fat. <laughs> you need fat. Um, so a lot of things have, that we discuss, right? Like to see if you're a candidate to have a BBL with either Dr. Earl or me, uh, you have to be healthy, no comorbidities, or if you do, they need to be controlled. Uh, your BMI needs to be less than 30 or less than 33.5 for me, uh, less than 50 years old. And even we have that upper limit of BMI for, especially for BBL surgery, we need fat. Like I said, you, what do you need? You need fat. So if you, you can't be that skinny that your BMI is less than 20 or that, then we're not going to have fat available. Uh, so it, an evaluation to see like the easiest way you send, you go to our website, click on the virtual consultation form. That's going to ask you to fill in uh, a questionnaire. Uh, with some of these questions, uh, high weight, medical conditions, and the pictures so we can evaluate 
uh, your body and see if you're a candidate. Okay. That's right. What, what do you think? of pre-op IV drips with vitamin vitamin C, magnesium, B-complex, and zinc? Um, so, I mean, in general, the, those things that you mentioned are okay. We just got to be careful with exactly what's being put in the drip um, because some things can potentially, for example, increase your, your bleeding risk, okay, things of that nature. So, um, vitamin C on its own um, is okay, uh, but you want to kind of keep it as simple as possible. Um, now, after surgery, a lot of our patients what, like to do some IV hydration, um, and that can help as well. You can start that, you know, post op day one. Uh, mostly, you know, electrolytes and IV fluids uh, are going to help you again. You know, stay hydrated and bounce back a little bit quicker after surgery. Okay, this is about the hernia repair. Do you do hernia repair? So it depends. Uh, so if you're doing a tummy tuck. Uh, we can do a hernia repair if it's in the belly button and it's a small hernia, less than two centimeters in size, then we can repair it at the time of a tummy tuck. But if you have a large hernia, uh, more than two centimeters or it's not in the belly button, then you should have it fixed beforehand. Why? Because those hernias need a mesh. And for that, we don't have meshes available here and you'll need an insurance to cover that because those meshes are very expensive. Um, so you'll need uh, a consultation with a general surgeon to have that fixed beforehand. And if you're having liposuction or a BBL, that has to be either like a very tiny hernia or have it fixed before because when we're doing the liposuction, we can actually injure that hernia and it can be very dangerous. Okay. Uh, what's the side effects of anesthesia? The side effects of anesthesia. So the most common side effect after general anesthesia is what we call post-operative nausea and vomiting. Okay, that's probably the most common side effect there. Um, and so we do a few things to try to try to prevent that. Of course, coming in very very hydrated to the surgery um, definitely helps. Um, and if you know that you have issues with you know nausea and vomiting or you've had surgery before. Uh, then a lot of times we'll, we'll use a, a patch, a scopolamine patch, which you put in the back of the ear there. Um, and you start that the night before surgery, uh, so that it's already working already in your system for the day of surgery. And then there's some other, you know, things that we can give you during surgery, such as Sofen and other IV medications that will help control that uh, as well. Okay. Um, the anesthesia that we do here is general anesthesia, but we uh, our CRNAs are great, and they try to keep it as simple as possible. So. Uh, we're not using you know a whole bunch of different medications and things like that to try to, like you say, minimize any potential side effects of anesthesia. Of course, once you get out of anesthesia, you are going to feel kind of groggy. You're going to feel a little bit out of it. Um, you may have, yeah, you may have the shakes or the chills, um, and that's not uncommon. You're not really going to remember like the first at least 30 minutes or so. So you're gonna, you're you're always in a recovery room for at least an hour. But of course, most patients are not going to remember that entire hour. You may. Maybe if you're lucky, you remember 30 minutes, maybe you remember the last 15, uh, but, but the memory function is not working well during those, that initial period, okay? And then, yeah, if you have the shivers, you have the shakes, um, that's pretty common, and we can give you a couple medications uh, to try to help with that um, so, that, you know, so that the body starts shivering. And you always do, you know, before we then send you out, uh, at least an hour or more uh, after surgery. Okay, do anemic patients have a possibility of getting surgery? Yes, but your hemoglobin levels need to be optimized before surgery. So the lowest hemoglobin level that we accept here is a hemoglobin of 11. The reason for that is because we don't have available here blood transfusions if we need it. So a safety measure for us that, uh, remember we're not in a hospital setting, we're in an office-based surgery setting. So we, we have to be safe uh, before putting you under, and there's always a risk of bleeding with every surgery, so we need to make sure that you're optimized as much as possible. So if you're anemic, you have to work with either your primary care or your hematologist with iron supplements or other supplements to optimize that hemoglobin level of at least 11 before surgery. Yeah, so that's definitely the lowest. And so we also get the question in a lot of patients with thalassemia, they'll ask us whether they can have surgery and, and it's all about the hemo level. Some patients with thalassemia, they can't get, they can't get their hemo level up to 11. And so if you just can't physically do it because of this genetic disorder, then unfortunately we, can, we, we can't do the elective surgery out here in the, in the office space setting. I like this one. Uh, can you talk a little bit of the risks of smoking? 
Yeah, for sure. So smoking is a huge no-no in, in plastic surgery. Uh, I, I don't take any smokers and Dr. Ridal does not take any smokers as well. So if you are a smoker, you have to uh, stop at, at a minimum of 30 days before surgery to 30 days after surgery and we are going to check. And if that nicotine test is positive, your surgery will be canceled, okay? Why is that? So smoking basically uh, causes your vessels to constrict, right? Causes vasoconstriction. Makes your vessels that are normally this big, this big, okay? So that reduces blood flow, reduces all the nutrients that your body needs to heal, reduces oxygenation, okay? So what does that lead to? Um, it leads to an increased risk of, of what, either skin or fat necrosis, okay? So basically skin or fat dying because it doesn't get the nutrients that it needs, the oxygenation that it needs. It leads to an increased risk of infection because your body can't fight off infections as well. Uh, and it increases your risk of wound breakdown. So the wound's not healing well, basically opening up and then having to go through you know, a lot, a lot of wound care. Um, so for all those reasons, uh, we, we don't take people that have positive nicotine in their systems. Um, and the question always, the secondary question is, what about THC, right? What about marijuana? So if you have, your THC is positive, but your nicotine is negative, then that's okay. We're okay with that. But remember, a lot of times some of those papers that you use and things like that, that some of the paraphernalia that's used for marijuana has nicotine in it, maybe unbeknownst to you, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If that nicotine test is positive, your surgery is going to get canceled. Okay. Oh. Just one how, okay. how long does it typically take to perform a BBL? So typically a BBL, two to three hours, more or less. It all depends on your body type and BMI and prior surgery. So if you had liposuction, sometimes there's some scar tissue, uh, but usually two to three hours. Yeah, so I would say the average is, is about you know two hours or so. We have someone that's fairly thin. You know, they're coming with that BMI of like 22 or something like that. It could potentially be an hour and a half. Um, and then if someone you know maybe adds a whole bunch of areas mm -hmm. or they add body tight or stuff like that, so a little bit bigger, and we have extra areas and we have body tight, yeah. and that may be a little bit longer. Um, but it's gonna be in that range. Okay, those the skinny the skinny BBL have less risk than the regular BBL. So in terms of the risk, they're they're fairly similar, right? There's not really uh, much difference in terms of the risk. Um, so, you know, the fat embolus, if you're not doing it with ultrasound and you're doing it blind and you don't know where you're going, that's going to be a risk for either one. You're still transferring fat, right? So we definitely use the ultrasound for both of those. Um, you know, the risk potential of the blood clots and the DVTs and the PEs is also quite similar. But that, 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 the reason why that may be different is not because you're doing a skinny BBL versus a regular BBL, but because the skinny BBL seems to have the lower BMIs, right? Mm -hmm. So. If you're, if you're doing a skinny BBL, you're probably in a BMI range in like the you know 20s, uh, whereas if, like we just said before, the higher the BMI, the higher the potential complication rate. Okay, I want to know if the incisions you make to do lipo will it go away? So unfortunately, incisions do not disappear, but we can try to make them in places that we can hide them easily and with proper scar treatment after surgery, try to make them as unnoticeable as possible, so as thin light and not raised as possible but unfortunately we can't say that incisions disappear <laughs> how long after giving birth uh most one way to have surgery all right so you want to wait at least six months okay so you want the body to kind of bounce back be able to bounce back uh, and that's for for most uh most body procedures so you know liposuction bbl tummy tuck um, the, cav you know, the, the, the caveat or the, the key there is though, if you're doing a breast procedure, it's not so much uh, you know, when did you give birth, but when did you stop breastfeeding, okay? So if it's a breast procedure, you need to wait six months from when you stop breastfeeding. So, All right, yeah. okay. Awesome. Run out of time. Awesome. <laughs> Run out of time. Wait, it went so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, we didn't discuss the most important subject, was, which was, you know, when can you wear a Christmas scrub cap? Clearly, <laughs> clearly, mean, it is time. No, it no, is no. that time is of year. Is it after Thanksgiving <laughs> or do you have to wait December 1st? Let's wait for the answers. Okay? I respected the turkey and I started wearing it this week. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think it was time. 
<laughs> okay, um, definitely now. Definitely <laughs> now. <laughs> Well, I don't. I think I have to wait because I have. To, I still have the mustache. Yeah. Actually, today's a sad day because it's the last yeah. de day of the mustache for 2022. So mustache is going away. It's gonna come back next November for Movember. Uh, so I just think you know maybe if I wear like Christmas scrub hat and the mustache, it's just gonna be too, too much. much. Yeah, too, too much. much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll wait till December. All right, everybody. All right, well, we had a great time here. I hope you learned a lot. Remember that uh, Dr. Ridal is always on uh, with her lives on Tuesdays, Tuesdays. with Tuesday Tips. Uh, and of course, you can always find me here uh, on Hump Day with Dr. Alex Rowe. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys. Ciao. <laughs>